to make up top. Um, the Office of Continuing Medical Education has a new management system for attendance and CME credit. Um, you can create a profile. They have the information posted in the lobby at highmarksce.com slash ETSU. You um, download a QR code reader on your phone if you do not already have one. And the QR code will be live 15 minutes prior to the start of the presentation and 30 minutes after the scheduled presentation end time. You will not be able to mark your attendance outside of this time frame. Um, the QR code can be used to claim credit for the session as well and must be done within 72 hours of the session. And you can download your transcript from the website. For residents, there's a sign-in sheet being passed around if you haven't been able to use this system. The Grand Rounds Committee um, requests that you silence your cell phones and refrain from unnecessary use during the presentation. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. T.J. O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill completed his undergraduate education at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California, majoring in biology and chemistry. He uh, completed his medical doctorate at the University of California in San Diego. He completed his internship and residency at Wilford Hall USAF Medical Center in Texas in internal medicine. He completed a fellowship in clinical nephrology at Wilford Hall USAF Medical Center in Texas and a fellowship in bench research nephrology at University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Dr. O'Neill is currently an associate staff member in nephrology at the James H. Quillen VA Medical Center and a subspecialty education coordinator in nephrology at East Tennessee State University and associate clinical professor of medicine at East Tennessee State University. Please welcome Dr. O'Neill. Hear me okay? All right, very good. Uh, as your chief resident just pointed out, uh, that title associate um, professor of medicine, I actually retired from full-time clinical in internal medicine about a year ago, uh, but I am continuing to teach and uh, write uh, and advocate for veterans uh, with kidney disease uh, in retirement. Uh, as psychiatry, Residents, um, you're going to have a lot to do with burnout, a lot to do with the counseling, perhaps, of people throughout the field of medicine in the next few years. Um, and uh, I really encourage that. A lot of my colleagues out of my generation decided that they were what they did. Uh, that what they did made them who they are. And as a result, when they get to the point of taking off that white coat, at the end of 30 or 40 years, they find that there isn't any person still inside the white coat. So, you know, I, I uh, congratulate you all. It's going to be an interesting and challenging career uh, trying not only to help your patients, but also your colleagues. Burnout is a big subject now in medicine and other places. Um, and one of the things I've had a chance to do before we get started with the academic subject, uh, I'm just, as you see, reading uh, a very interesting book called The Tyranny of Metrics. And this is going to affect your career field as well as it affected mine. Uh, and it's well worth, uh, it's, uh, well researched, uh, and a uh, good subject to learn about because a lot of the psychic pressure that people in medicine feel is driven by the fact that they no longer understand that these numbers that they're being uh, remunerated based on, judged based on, ranked based on, in many cases have no relationship to what it is they feel they went through all that you're going through to do. So, you know, I, I would recommend The Tyranny of Metrics by Jerry Muller. Uh, it's a quick read, but well-researched and worth thinking about in context. 
Now, pun intended, fluids and electrolytes can be a very dry subject. So what I'm going to try to do this morning is run through uh, some basics about salt, water, kidney function, um, but also a little bit of focus on the form of hyponatremia, or forms of hyponatremia that uh, psychiatrists see um, and reasons why uh, they may see them and how to deal with them. We're, ba <coughs> excuse me. We're basically a set of interconnected buckets, if you will, uh, of and the partitioning is driven by uh, tissue and plasma oncotic pressure balance, various salt pumps, sodium chloride, other electrolyte pumps. Uh, but as we treat people with fluid and electrolyte imbalances, you have to remember that we're not just a bag, a single bag of water. We're a set of interconnected compartments with different barriers to the flow of fluid and electrolyte between them. And interventions that you may make in the emergency room, the ICU, on the ward uh, are going to take a while to equilibrate uh, between all of these buckets. And then between the contents of the extracellular fluid, or ECF, and ICF, very great differences. This is why the individual who has danced all night uh, frantically uh, on an alpha agent and is coming in exhausted, dehydrated, uh, and experiencing rhabdomyolysis, may have a potassium that's so high you have to scream for the nephrologist uh, to try to put the person on dialysis and get it down because you see that green inside the intracellular fluid, huge amount of potassium in there compared to the very small amount that's present outside. So these have, the, the differences between the electrolyte content of these buckets have some very real and very uh, powerful clinical implications uh, that you will have to deal with with the sort of patients that you're likely to see. By the way, this lecture and all the other lectures are on D2L uh, in a folder called Resident Nephrology Curriculum. Uh, there are about uh, maybe uh, 30 to 40 presentations like this along with the primary literature uh, and I update it every three months uh, to make sure that it's still current. So basically it starts off being complex and unfortunately uh, dealing with hyponatremia is not quite uh, as simple as Coach Snoopy here uh, uh, thinks of. Whoop. Now, when you see a patient, eyes, ears, and hands are critical. A lot of people go straight to the lab work and try to judge what's going on. Step back while you're waiting for the labs and say, what is the actual fluid status of this patient? You know, the pulse is important, but you're going to be dealing with people who are loaded with drugs potentially and may have tachycardia that's pharmacologic rather than physiologic. Um, dehydration due to uh, 8 to 12 hours of continuous, ceaseless motion. Um, and one of the most powerful things that you can do, if you can get the patient to lay back uh, can you uh, trigger that from here? My mouse is uh, not connected to this screen. Looks like the mouse is connected to this screen, but not this one. And I will need that. Ah, bingo. Okay, it's on the... Thank you. Uh, In a normal state, they're discovering that there are a number of different channels with excitatory and inhibitory neurons that tell a patient who's physiologically and pharmacologically normal 
when to drink and when to stop drinking. And obviously lesions, physiologic or pharmacologic, in any of these areas can affect how the patient's drinking and when they stop. And you notice that that little knot of blue, yellow, and red inhibitory and excitatory are all located in an area that is suspect for physiologic change in people with psychosis, schizophrenia. So I'm going to get out of this before it triggers to the next YouTube. And salt, in other words, sodium and chloride are about volume. Water is about osmolarity and tonicity. You gotta separate those when you're evaluating a patient and also when you're treating them. Salt's about volume. Because the sodium is excluded over the short term from the interior of cells, it is extracellular. So, the total amount of sodium on board defines the extracellular volume. And too much total body salt is going to cause congestive failure and edema. On the other hand, too little is going to cause tachycardia, loss of skin turgor, orthostatic hypotension, and decreased urine output. Now, because water rapidly crosses most cell membranes, the two affect salt and water, affect the body differently. And if the salt concentration is different on two sides of the cell membrane, water is going to move to equalize this. So if you dump a lot of hypotonic fluid, or if the patient dumps a lot of hypotonic fluid, beer potomania, um, compulsive water drinking uh, in a patient with a psychiatric condition, you're going to see edema of the brain. You're going to see the neural tissues that are inside a water uh, transmissible barrier begin to swell. And this can become very rapidly life-threatening if the individual has damage, structural or pharmacological, to the blood-brain barrier. So if you give a lot of hypotonic fluid, Ringer's lactate, for instance, or D5 and water, to a patient, thinking that that's going to equalize, that's going to, to uh, bring up their total fluid status, what you may wind up with is a very sick patient due to migration osmotically of that free water into the cells, into the brain, and something called disequilibrium syndrome. If you have a psychiatric patient who is undergoing dialysis, so you have a severely depressed patient with chronic kidney disease who's on dialysis, they go to dialysis, compass mentis, and they come back and an hour later they get bizarre, sleepy, hyperreflexic. You're dealing with disequilibrium syndrome because of another reason. The nephrologist pulled off too much urea too fast. And that caused, in that three and a half to four hour period, the blood to become hypoosmolar with respect to the brain. And you've now got uh, intracerebral hypertension, brain edema, from the migration of the free water from the relatively hypotonic blood into the brain. So these have very real clinical implications. Now, Looking at that overall clinical volume status is critical. You know, your available clinical tools, urine output, physical exam, BUN to creatinine ratio, and fractional excretion of sodium or urea are the clinical tools that you have. I would very much um, suggest that you go to this YouTube um, about the physical exam of the neck veins and review that. 
you know, we're, we're more and more dependent on laboratories, CT scans, uh, and, and other invasive procedures and, and laboratory procedures for our diagnoses. But you can learn a tremendous amount about the patient's fluid status if you can get them to lie back on the exam table in a 30 degree head up position quietly without valve salving. And while you're talking to them and calming them down, just watch those neck veins. First, isolate the carotid arterial pulse and then move back from it a little bit. What you're going to see is typically an external jugular, especially if they're valve salving that will move up and down with their breath. And then look carefully for a fluctuating pulse within that, going up and down within the respiratory cycle. And that fluctuating pulse is the IJ. And if you can locate where that IJ pulse is and measure the distance down to the sternum and then add four to five centimeters, you've got the central venous pressure. And regardless what the state of external dehydration or edema may be, because things are changing very rapidly, if you can identify that internal jugular pulse and get that CVP estimate from the physical exam, you're a leg up on knowing whether that patient is fluid overloaded or terribly dry and needs IV or oral rehydration fluid. The BUN to creatinine ratio reflects the fact that the proximal tubule of the kidney sucks back urea when the patient is intravascularly volume depleted faster than it does creatinine. So a rise in the BUN to creatinine ratio is a basic physiologic tool, <coughs> again, to add to your information about the hydration status. And the fractional excretion of sodium is a great tool as long as the patient is not on a diuretic. Because diuretics get in and muck up the kidney's ability to appropriately reabsorb sodium. In a case like that, you have to go to the ratio, the fractional excretion of urea, which is not affected by diuretics. And if that fractional excretion of urea, which you calculate the same way as you do the fractional excretion of sodium, but substitute the urea concentrations in for sodium, if it's less than 30%, the patient is dehydrated, regardless of whether they're on a diuretic or not. Now, volume depletion comes in stages. You get a little orthostatic and upright tachycardia at 5%. 10%, you're tacking along supine. 15%, you're in a relative hypotension. And remember, some of these patients may be 160 over 100, but if they come in at 110 over 80, for them, that may be relative hypotension. So knowing something about the patient's baseline physiologic status is important. At 20%, you're in frank shock. And at greater than 20%, you're looking at imminent cardiovascular collapse and possible death unless you act judiciously but quickly. I mentioned edema. Edema is not about water. It's about salt and protein. If an individual is edematous, they're carrying around too much sodium or too little albumin. And you've got to keep those in mind because what holds fluid inside the blood vessels is the plasma oncotic strength that comes from the albumin level. And so if you've got an individual who's terribly malnourished carrying around an albumin of two, they may have peripheral edema even if they're not in congestive heart failure, even if they're not fluid overloaded. Now, you carry around with you a tool for judging edema that you don't or may not even know about. It's the tip of your thumb and in particular the line where your thumbnail uh, meets the bed of the nail. In order to judge edema, I've seen a lot of my colleagues, and early on in my career, I would come up to a patient, while I was talking with them, I would just sort of reach down and press and say, nah, 
two plus edema, document that and walk away. If you want to be a little bit more consistent and accurate about it between patients and over time, take your thumb and press over the flat part of the shin just hard enough to get the white rim where the thumbnail meets the thumb. It's about three to five pounds. And then count, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, and let go. Nothing is absolutely accurate. But for you, unless your hemoglobin changes dramatically, which would affect how much pressure it took to make that white rim around the end of the thumbnail, if you do that, your 2 plus edema is going to be the same a year from now and across all the patients you see in clinic today. Somebody else's 2 plus edema may be somewhat different, but at least you've got a semi-quantitative tool that is built into you that you can use to get some level of standardization for your clinical observation. There are also certain uh, endocrinologic abnormalities like hypothyroidism that change cellular metabolism that can lead to edema that's not due to sodium and uh, or um, the uh, level of albumin. Um, and you have to be conscious of those existing when you make your clinical assessments. Now, if you've got a patient in the ICU or you've got a patient on the ward who is throwing up or has severe diarrhea, and you're trying to balance what they are losing and get them back to a state of clinical euvolemia. You've got to be conscious what fluid they're losing. An individual who is uh, losing, uh, say, saliva that has, uh, because of an obstructed esophagus at large volumes, and you can lose two to three liters a day in some cases of just saliva from an esophageal obstruction. That person is only losing a fluid that contains 30 to 80 milliequivalents per liter of sodium. So giving them normal saline is going to make them hypernatremic very quickly. So Keeping track of what kind of fluid they're losing is a key also to knowing what, it is, what it's going to take to get them back to a euvolemic state. If you want to acutely give volume, give salt. If you want to control osmolarity, give or withhold water. That's the bottom line. Now, I would recommend you look at New England Journal, most recent issue, because over the years, uh, there's been this split between surgery and internal medicine about what constitutes a good fluid to give for volume. The internists would say, ah, give them normal saline. The surgeons would say, no, give them Ringer's lactate. Well, this very interesting set of articles in New England Journal on acute, critically ill, and non-critically ill patients tries to tear this apart and see which fluid actually is the best one to give. And I recommend you look those articles over and there's going to be a lot of discussion in the medical literature about how generalizable the conclusions. But we're talking about a study with 14,000 patients and it done at Vanderbilt right down the road. And it's already been out in the public uh, domain on CBS News. Uh, study finds normal saline causes increased uh, kidney injuries. And your patients, if you hook up an IV to them, especially if they're slightly paranoid or uh, and uh, aware of what's going on in the world, may say, what kind of fluid is that? I don't want that. I just heard that that can injure my kidneys. Turns out the only times it injured the kidneys were when somebody connected the normal saline up to the patient and gave them four or five liters and made them hyperchloremic, acidotic, and injured the kidneys that way. But you have to know these things uh, and be prepared in case your patients challenge you, and they will. <laughs>
here are the common IV fluid composition. And you can see that normal saline, there's nothing normal about normal saline. You know, you're 135 to 145 uh, milliequivalents per liter of sodium and 95 to 105 milliequivalents per liter of chloride. Normal saline is 154 of both per liter with nothing else in there. So if you get your severely dehydrated diabetic patient on your ward and you pump and they're in diabetic ketoacidosis with a lot of beta hydroxybutyrate and ketones around and you pump normal saline into them and don't watch them closely, very quickly you're going to find that the chloride replaces the hydroxybutyrate and the ketones and you've got a severely hyperchloremic acidotic patient for as you started with a diabetic ketoacidotic patient. D5 ringers lactate, D5 normal saline, quarter, that they're all uh, in here and it, it's worth copying this off and sticking it somewhere in your uh, cell phone or somewhere uh, in your cloud uh, archives to just have available to think about. Keeping in mind that that lactate up there in Ringer's lactate, once the patient gets back toward being reasonably euvolemic, their liver is going to chew that up and make it into bicarb. There's another fluid out there called uh, plasmolite A, which is supposedly the perfect fluid uh, for rehydration that's available in Europe much more than in the US. The problem with that is that about the, uh, 25 to 35 uh, milli, uh, milli equivalents per liter of gluconate is in that, which is not metabolized into bicarb. And so it doesn't help you fight the tendency toward acidosis. Now, the normal range of sodium, 135 to 150, and so if it drops below 135, it's hyponatremia, and if it rises above 150, it's hypernatremia. Hyponatremia is by far the more common abnormality. Um, a significant number of hospitalized patients display hyponatremia, and it's even more common in psychiatric patients. And it can kill both acutely and injure chronically. Serum sodium concentration, on the other hand, is about the water content of the blood. And remember, we're about half water. Because of some physiologic differences, the proportion varies somewhat between men and women and also over the age range and over the normal weight to obesity range. But the average American pours about 150 millimoles or one bag of normal saline with his chips and diet and food every day. And um, a, the regulation that takes place uh, of when to drink to keep that from going too high, when to drink hypotonic fluid, uh, was driven by those competing push-me-pull-you mechanisms that you saw in the video. Now, you can't look at a glass of salt water and tell the difference between the salt and the water. But the kidney can because it plays with different pumps and different permeabilities of membranes along the length of the nephron. And I'll briefly go into that. Why do they call diuretics water pills? Well, the diuretics force the kidney to lose salt and that salt stays in the urine as it goes down into the medulla where free water is ordinarily reabsorbed. If the diuretic is forcing the individual to lose salt, that fluid that dips down into the kidney medulla has more salt in it and that salt fights the ability of the body to reabsorb the free water. So diuretics force the kidneys to lose both salt and water. And there are several different types uh, that affect the kidneys 
at different levels. But the bottom line is, whenever you give a diuretic, water passively follows the salt that's being lost because of the diuretic. So the proximal tubule reabsorbs both salt and water in bulk. About 75% of what the glomeruli filter in euvolemia is reabsorbed in the first part of that proximal tubule. The loop of Henle, proximal part, reabsorbs water, and the distal ascending limb reabsorbs salt. And that's where, mo mo where all of your loop diuretics work. There's a great difference between where the different diuretics affect the kidney. And you can see that there are both pharmacologic and, as in the case of mannitol or urea, osmotic diuretics that affect reabsorption at different points. But basically, when things get down into the, uh, into the medulla uh, of the kidney, what's happening is that there's a very, very high concentration, 1,200 milliosm uh, per kilogram of combined salt and urea. And if the kidney can pump out almost all the salt when that dives down into the cortical collecting duct, now all it has to do is sit there and open the door and let the free water be sucked back into the medulla by the very high osmotic strength in uh, the medulla of the kidney. Now, when that's working normally, things are great. But if you've got an individual, say, on lithium, that process is going to be inhibited, and they're going to have a dysfunctional reabsorption of both salt and water. The collecting duct is the critical part where the osmolarity is regulated. The tubules before that are where the salt is regulated. So where the arrow is when the, when the urine gets to that point, now you've got the osmotic control of the body. And that's driven by something called antidiuretic hormone and aquaporin. When an individual's osmolarity has gone too high, the hypothalamus kicks out antidiuretic hormone. The antidiuretic hormone tells the cells in the collecting duct, make aquaporin. Aquaporin is a door that it sticks on the cell and allows water to be dragged back from the urine into the blood to try to regulate the osmolarity. It's a very, very sensitive process, but it can be messed up by a number of things. Psychiatric abnormalities, psychotropic drugs, uh, behavioral uh, disorders, uh, and uh, actual injury to the renal tubules by uh, acute tubular necrosis, uh, shock, uh, or um, hypoperfusion uh, uh, of the kidney. Because down in this area of the kidney, the blood flow is very sluggish. The osmolarity is very high. These cells are struggling to stay alive against some very unusual uh, physiologic conditions. And it doesn't take much to push them over the edge. So serum osmolarity can be calculated by that formula about three lines up from the bottom. And it's useful to know that laboratories use two different ways of measuring osmolarity. One of them is called vapor pressure. The other is called freezing point. Most labs nowadays use the freezing point type of measurement because it's more accurate. If you have a laboratory that uses the older vapor pressure type, it can be fooled by an individual who has a lot of extra ethanol or some um, a drug, uh, some substance on board in their bloodstream that has a high vapor pressure. And it may fool the test 
and give you an abnormal or an, an inaccurate uh, serum osmolarity. So you can calculate that roughly, and as you can see, uh, the, the trick with dialysis that can get your patient with psychiatric problems who's on dialysis into trouble is that BUN over 2.8 term. In a four-hour dialysis, you drop the urea in the bloodstream by two-thirds. So if they started at 150 and the dialysis has dropped the urea to 50, you've now got a delta BUN of 100 divided by 3, that's about 30 milliosms, or the physiologic equivalent of changing the serum sodium like that by 15. And what that can do is cause a patient, especially one with recent structural damage to the brain, like a stroke or a tumor, and cause their brain to swell abruptly and kill them. But what you'll see clinically is an individual who 15 minutes to an hour and a half after dialysis becomes irritable, sleepy, um, agitated, hyperreflexic, and that's your signal that the dialysis has probably caused disequilibrium. Osmolarity has to be closely regulated. Uh, a 9% change in total water content, or about 7 liters of water in an 80 kilogram person, uh, can cause an individual to be severely hyperosmolar. I'm talking uh, sodium of 160, 165, which can be rapidly lethal. And for that, they may come in looking shrunken and dehydrated, but you wouldn't want to give normal saline to that person to restore their balance. You need to give free water. The individual who's been hyper agitated uh, on the ward can't stop moving, uh, who is losing a lot of insensible fluid. As you saw from one of the slides back there, sweat has a very relatively low sodium content. That individual can become hypernatremic rather quickly. If the body is stuck, if the body is caught between a rock and a hard place, um, is hemorrhaging severely or losing extracellular fluid volume for any reason, and the intravascular volume gets down, they're starting to shock out, they can't hold on to salt anymore. The diarrhea from the cholera, the sweat from the uh, hyper-agitated state, uh, they're unable to hang on to salt anymore. The, the best last rescue is to hang on to free water. Now, free water is only about a sixth to an eighth as good at filling up the intravascular tank as sodium is. But the body will develop what's called appropriate antidiuretic hormone state because it's under threat. If it doesn't do that, it can't hold on to salt, it's got to hold on to something, it's going to hold on to free water, and you'll see your patient starting to get hyponatremic. So that's what the, that term, the body sacrifices tonicity for volume when the overall extracellular fluid status is threatened. We talked about the difference between and the gap between the calculated plasma osmolarity. Uh, if you calculate that osmolarity and then you get a freezing point osmolarity and there's more than a 10 milliosm per kg difference, you got to think of these things. The patient may have, you're probably going to know if they're drunk, but in addition to whether they just drank ethanol, you've also got to think of these other things because if they drank not just ethanol but these other substances, they can be critically ill in a hurry. And there's a, a good uh, clinical calculator for the osmolar gap with some reminders on the web uh, out of the University of Iowa that's a live link uh, in the uh, presentation that you can get off B2L. Uh, 
So why all the concern again? Serum osmolarity falls rapidly. The cells swell while they try to shed the internal osmolites. This isn't too bad for blood cells. They'll just puff up a little bit. The liver cells will puff up a little bit. Brain cells puff up a little bit. You're in trouble. And you've got severe increased intracranial pressure. I actually saw a colleague of mine back when I was a resident uh, herniate the brain of a patient with an unsuspected brain tumor through the clivus by dialyzing them too rapidly uh, and causing uh, increased intracranial pressure. It was not a pretty scenario. Now, hyponatremia in the ICU clearly kills. Uh, if you define hyponatremia as less than 135 being mild, less than 130 being moderate, and less than 125 being severe, um, you see that you know, somewhere around 8%, 8 to 9% uh, had borderline hypernatremia or severe uh, hypernatremia, but only a fifth had hyponatremia. And that does kill. Uh, because after adjusting for confounders, mortality was 30% higher for moderate hyponatremia, and that's a sodium of 130. You want to keep your patient away from having a sodium of less than 130 milliequivalents. And if it was severe, less than 125, you can see an 80% increase in mortality when all the other confounding factors were removed. It really messes with the patient's ability to survive. Hypernatremia they, was also associated independently with 30-day mortality and to somewhat the same extent for mild and a little bit less so for hypernatremia. So that's uh, the, the root of the statement that having a low sodium is more dangerous to your patient than having a high sodium. But, you know, a 30% increase, well, 30 to 34% uh, either way is, is still pretty significant. And it's not just inpatients. You know, there are a lot of 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, walking around on diuretics, not being well monitored, who have hyponatremia. And it turns out that even mild hyponatremia causes gait instabilities and an increased risk of falling. Throw a little diabetic neuropathy into it or age-related um, uh, neurologic uh, dysfunction, uh, and what you can wind up with is a serious, serious risk of full femoral fracture, which in many cases can be a death sentence. So when this study that was looked at by Gankin and Kegney in Kidney International in 2013, what they found up, uh, what they found out was that 10%, well, more than 10% of the deaths during the follow-up patient were hyponatremia, and that was way out of proportion to the number of outpatients who actually were hyponatremic. They, they uh, will die uh, much faster. Uh, the unadjusted hazard ratio, 1.94, almost twice as likely to die if they were outpatients with hyponatremia. So again, you watch these things, especially in the psychiatric context of a higher prevalence of hyponatremia in your population than in the general medical population. So how do you break it down? What's your your checklist, if you will, for doing a differential diagnosis. You can have factitious or artifactual hyponatremia. The individual with the glucose of 650 and a serum sodium of 132. Uh, you know, you make the correction and sure enough, they're probably not really hyponatremic in an objective sense. That's factitious. The individual had a resident while I was over at the VA who came to me and said, TJ, I've got this guy who's got a serum sodium of 82 and a chloride 
of 65, and it just doesn't seem that they don't have any of the physical signs. They said, have you gone up to the laboratory and looked at the serum? No. Why don't you go do that? And he comes back with this tube that has milk, practically, above the uh, packed down red blood cells. And he said, my god, uh, this guy's got a triglyceride of over 5,000. I said, bingo. Why has that happened? Thought about it for a while. He said, well, wait a minute. Sodium and chloride can't get dissolved in fat. So there was very little water serum in there, and most of what was circulating was fat. And that was artifactually driving the sodium and the chloride down. So if you've got a picture that doesn't make sense, and this is a diabetic or an obese individual or someone at risk for hyperlipidemia, ask the technician to, if you can't, look at the serum. Turned out the technicians had processed the sample and never made any mention about the fact that the supernatant looked like milk. Hypovolemia causes hyponatremia for the reason we said. The body will sacrifice the tonicity if it feels that the volume is threatened. There's euvolemic hyponatremia. The individual, like uh, one, of my, uh, one of my colleagues in my fellowship at UTSA, was purebred Irish, straight out of, uh, you know, downtown Dublin. And one time I get a call, and he's over in the ER in atrial fibrillation with a sodium of 130. And I went over and said, my God, man, what were you doing? He said, well, I got to the sixth or eighth pint, and I decided to keep going. Okay. Um, and hypervolemic hyponatremia, uh, when you uh, have severe renal failure, congestive heart failure, uh, you're, not, you're, you're at that point where your kidneys are not only unable to get rid of water, they can't get rid of salt either. But don't concentrate on the labs. Concentrate on the patient. Do the physical exam. Review that video from YouTube about examining the neck veins. Look at the skin turgor. That's more useful in a young person than an old person. I'm 67 going on 68, and I've got a little tenting here, and I can tell you I'm well hydrated. Look at the pulse. Is it appropriate to the patient's position? Do a positional BP. You know, do it yourself, and do it with a manual cuff, because these automated blood pressure cuffs, especially in older patients, are very unreliable. And nursing notes that I've seen constantly saying, no orthostatic blood pressure drop. And I will go up with a manual cuff and stand the patient up for 30 seconds, and their systolic drops by 25, and their diastolic by 15, and their pulse goes up by 15. And the reason why, they put the cuff on over the hospital gown, and the fabric between the stiff blood vessel and the cuff completely obscured the uh, actual reading. There's a very good Schreier um, tree to use in hyponatremia. Think of diabetes. Think about if your patients just come back from a, a, a urologic or gynecologic procedure where they used an irrigant containing glycine. That can cause factitious hyponatremia think of hyperlipidemia. Now there's a syndrome of appropriate ADH that we talked about from overdiuresis. Cerebral salt wasting, very rare, but it will cause severe volume depletion and severe hyponatremia and any cause of extracellular fluid volume loss. Relatively rare. Critical difference is that Cerebral salt wasting involves inappropriate renal salt loss. And so rather than clamping down on the sodium in the urine, it's flooding the urine with salt. On the other hand, SIADH is in a euvolemic or hypervolemic 
bulimic patient. And the primary treatment for cerebral salt wasting, volume replacement. Euvolemic potomania, beer drinkers, schizophrenics, long distance runners, syndrome of inappropriate ADH. And there are a number of causes, physiologic conditions, some tumors, medications, prolonged pain or nausea, colonoscopy preparations, hypothyroidism, sick hyponatremia, especially in your AIDS patient. Psychogenic, 10 to 20 percent of compulsive water drinkers. Up to 20 percent of psychiatric patients can display it. Uh, and it can be associated with nausea, vomiting, even death. Neuroendocrine studies show hyponatremic schizophrenic patients secrete ADH at baseline, even though they're hyper uh, hypoosmotic. So that little knot of green, red, and yellow cells at the base of the brain, for some reason, associated with the schizophrenia alone, independent in many cases of the anti-schizophrenic medications, is just not working right. And they present with poorer neuropsychologic functioning atop that from the schizophrenia. So if this individual decompensates psychiatrically and you're wondering why, consider if you've ruled the other things out, check the serum sodium. It could well be that that same thing that's causing that almost twice uh, the death rate in chronic outpatient general medicine patients from hyponatremia is affecting this individual um, uh, in a psychiatric way. Um, there's, I won't go through the details here, but there's good literature suggesting that although oxytocin treatment may be beneficial for remediating social cognitive impairment, you've got to be careful because oxytocin can also cause an ADH excess like state. So again, if you're going to treat a schizophrenic with oxytocin, watch that serum sodium. Medications, there's a, a host of them. And again, you can uh, go to websites or read about each one of these. SSRI antidepressants in elderly patients, very commonly used nowadays and they can cause an SIADH-like state. Hypervolemia from dilated congestive heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, or severe chronic renal insufficiency can also lead to hyponatremia. It's not always how far you go, but how fast you get there. Uh, I'm reminded of that song by Mellon uh, from a number of years ago. Anyway. Um, serum sodium of 120 reached within six hours can cause severe physiologic and neurologic changes. Over 100 reached over two to three weeks can be almost asymptomatic. Correcting hyponatremia of less than 120 faster than 0.5 mole per liter per hour can cause severe irreversible changes with central pontine myelinolysis. You got to avoid correcting them too fast. There are guidelines for treatment of asymptomatic and symptomatic. If they're symptomatic, you can go much quicker uh, if you know that they've taken a while to get there. If you think that they may have uh, taken uh, a long time to get there, correct them up to uh, 120 to 125, and then very, very slowly after that. Oops. Don't forget the basics, though. Okay, uh, as you treat the hyponatremia, emerging neurologic symptoms may not always be central pontine myelinolysis. The alcoholic with thiamine deficiency may appear both on CT or MRI scan very much like an individual with uh, excess hyponatremia correction, central pontine myelinolysis. So especially if you're pouring calories into a malnourished 
alcoholic, you know, give them the banana bag, give them the thiamine, give them the stuff that is going to prevent this uh, other form of loss of myelin in the central nervous system. Hypernatremia, a lot less common, but as we pointed out, it can be lethal. Uh, if correct, place at greater than one milliosm per hour, there's felt to be somewhat less risk of CNS toxicity. But again, remember, in hypernatremia, what are you replacing them with? Free water. Make darn sure they don't have a recent stroke or a brain tumor before you start pouring free water to the hypernatremic patient because you very well may cause uh, a, a severe uh, intracranial hypertension. There's a Schreier diagram for that. I won't bore you with it. Let's throw a clinical moment at you. And this is the end. Uh, the, this is the last four slides. You got a 44-year-old guy admitted to an inpatient unit because of disorientation and hallucinations. He was admitted to the hospital four days ago for a subarachnoid hemorrhage that was repaired with surgical clips. Medical history otherwise unremarkable. Before he was admitted to the hospital, he took no meds. Uh, he has normal saline IV running. On physical exam, he's disoriented, confused, he's hallucinating. Temperature is normal. Supine blood pressure, 140 over 80. Rate is 102 and regular. Respiratory rate, 16. Upon standing, his blood pressure is 120 over 60. Pulse goes up to 120. Jugular venous pulsations undetectable with the patient's supine. And the remainder of the physical exam is normal. Is this guy hypervolemic, euvolemic, or hypovolemic? Anybody or all of you. Is his volume high, normal, or low? Low. I see a low here. Yes, it's low. Why? His neck veins are undetectable. You stand him up. You know, he's like that old line out of Firesign Theater. He's no fun. He falls right over. You stand him up, and his blood pressure drops by 20, and his pulse goes up by 20, and he's down. Look at his numbers. 118 sodium, chloride 85. He's not acidotic. His osmolarity is not bad. Serum uric acid, urine sodium, 105. Wait a minute. He's hypovolemic. He's badly hypovolemic. His serum sodium ought to be down like this, and he's not on any medications, not, certainly not on diuretics. So he's got way too much salt in his urine compared to his hypovolemic hyponatremia. So what's he got? Adrenal insufficiency, cerebral salt wasting, hypothyroidism, or syndrome of inappropriate ADH? Anybody? Hmm? Cerebral. Yep. Patient is volume depleted, clinically dry, losing salt in the urine, not consistent with SIADH. It could have been hypoadrenalism, except there's no predisposing factors. Always, you know, uh, the patient's trying to tell you what's wrong. Go with the history and the physical exam. And there's no hyperkalemia or metabolic acidosis that would have gone along with the uh, hypoadrenalism. Hypothyroidism, yes, it resembles SIADH. This guy's tachycardic and volume depleted. That doesn't go along. The amount of urinary sodium compared to the urinary potassium is huge. He's just pouring out the salt. And it came on a few days after a neurosurgical procedure. That's another clue as to what's going on. Let's take the last clinical case. 65-year-old man consulted to you because of progressive disorientation and falls admitted to the hospital three days ago for evaluation of the lung mass, brain metastases, found on CT, he was a smoker since age 17, treated for hypertension with amlodipine and fosinopril, physical exam, he's disoriented, confused, and hallucinating. You've got a great service here, guys. Temperature is normal, supine blood pressure normal, pulse rate normal, respiratory rate 18, upon assisted standing, blood pressure and pulse don't change, Jugular venous pulsations are present in the mid-neck with the patient supine. Here's his laboratories, including the urine, sodium, 
Not too much difference in the sodium here. Bicarb, normal. Potassium, normal. BUN, normal. He's got a modestly elevated spot urine sodium. What's he running? Normal saline. So this guy is euvolemic hyponatremia with the history of that as his chest x-ray. So is this volume depletion, adrenal insufficiency, syndrome of inappropriate ADH, or hypothyroidism? Yep. SIADH associated with lung cancer. It's probably small cell, oat cell type cancer. He's clinically not at all dry. His urinary osmolarity dramatically higher than his serum osmolarity. Let's go back. Urine, serum osmolarity, 252 sodium uh, and um, 122. And his uh, spot uh, serum, uh, I'm sorry, urine uh, osmolarity uh, is uh, 650, much higher. He's, uh, the free water is just being sucked out of this guy's urine and back into his bloodstream. And so the hyponatremia may be making the cerebral edema from the brain metastases worse, confounding and compounding the neurologic symptoms. So, summary. Abnormalities of sodium concentration are common. Hyponatremia more common than hypernatremia. Abnormal sodium concentration most likely is an issue created by the body's mechanism for water handling. Either one can be lethal. The diagnosis includes a thorough history, medication use, water and other fluid uh, intake, systematic determination of the patient's clinical hydration status, eyes, ears, and hands, guys, uh, you know, way long before they get to the CT scanner or the MI, uh, MRI scanner. Then look at your simultaneous serum and urine osmolarity and make sure they're drawn, taken simultaneously because I've seen very um, misleading results when the orders for the serum and urine osmolarity are taken off four or six hours different and then they're presented in the medical record as if they were simultaneous and you get really uh, confugulated. And once a firm diagnosis has been reached, treat the cause of the water or salt loss keeping CNS toxicity from treating it too rapidly. Thank you. Appreciate your attention. Questions, thoughts, comments. It's a big subject to go over in an hour. This, again, is on D2L. I just uh, came here straight from the medicine office and got it loaded uh, so you can go to D2L and pull this down as well as a, a host uh, of papers uh, out of the literature that go through the reason, uh, the justification for the points made. Any thoughts? Okay. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you much. If you're a resident and you weren't able to use the new system for attendance and want to be counted as present, please see me after the And lecture. please be brutally honest in your evaluations. I need that so I can uh, titrate this uh, and, and make it better each time I give it.